His works, he who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke, I will sing to the Lord with all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. May my mediation be pleasing to Him as I rejoice in the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's Jesus. Sing hallelujah.
darkness thou has ended In the kingdom of light In the kingdom of light Forever under your dominion You're the king of my life You're the king of my life Sing that again The reign of darkness now darkness now is ended in the kingdom of light in the kingdom of light forever under your dominion you're the king of my life you're the king of my
above it all. You reign above it all. Over the universe. Over the universe and over every heart. There is no higher Jesus you reign. Jesus, you reign. And all the earth. Sing hallelujah to the everlasting. 
One says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Why has Christ set us free? What does he say? For freedom. He set us free for freedom. For nothing else but that, that our hearts and our minds and our bodies are free. Our spirits are free. Our souls are set free. Completely free. Completely restored. Shalom in our lives to permeate, to saturate, and to fill us. Why? For freedom. And so he says, he says, so stand firm then. And, and he says, don't let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Don't let it be burdened by the yoke of slavery. Because my, my plan for you, my intent for you, my desire for you is that you are free and that you lived like you live like ones who are free and so as we come into this place this morning are we ready to stand firm are we ready to stand firm as ones who have been set free for the sake of freedom where in our lives do we say i'm i'm bound by the yoke of that oppression i'm bound by the I, i'm a slave to that i'm a slave to that thought I'm a slave to that meeting that I had earlier this week that I regret or I, I wish I didn't say that or I wish I didn't do that or I'm a, I'm a slave to that behavior. I, I'm a slave to my fear. I'm a slave to, to my future. I'm, I'm a slave to that and, and, it's, and it's not life-giving. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of Truth says stand firm because for freedom I have set you free. I have come to break the yoke of that. Amen. You don't have to carry that with you into today. You don't have to walk with that bondage. You don't have to be gripped by that fear. You don't have to be oppressed under the yoke of that burden. Because for freedom, for freedom's sake, because I love you so much, I have set you free. Paul tells the early church, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And then he says, again, I say rejoice. It's interesting that he reiterates that, right? Like, like maybe they needed to hear it two times. Rejoice in the Lord always. 
Uh, again, did you hear me? I say rejoice. Why? Because for freedom, Christ has set us free. Amen? So let's sing that again. But let's sing that as ones who choose to stand firm. That we choose to stand firm in what Christ has done for us and is doing for us in this very present moment. The Holy Spirit is ministering to us to set us free from the bondage of oppression, from the yoke of sin and slavery and death. So church, let's rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say it. Let's rejoice in the Lord. Amen. who have been set free for freedom's sake and teach us Lord how to walk in that freedom come Holy Spirit we rejoice in you Lord we rejoice in the good God that you are and you have always been and you will always be. And so where our hearts are troubled, we choose to trust you, God, that you are good, and your love endures forever and ever and ever and ever and ever to every single person in this room this morning, whether we love you back or not, your love endures forever and ever and ever. And all of God's people shout, Amen. 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 You know, this is 
why we come together, or one of the reasons why we come together, it's just to remind each other of the good God who holds us in all of creation. It's to remind one another of the love that is turned toward you. And, and some days I may come in and I might need that reminder. And some days you might come in and, and you might need that reminder. Some days I might come in and I need to know that, that, that freedom is, is for me and for my week and for my situation and for my trials and some weeks you'll come in and, and you'll need to be reminded that freedom is for you and for your situation and, and the things that are burdening your life and and your marriages and your children and your workplaces and all of those things right but when we gather as a church we remind each other of that we remind each other of the goodness of god that is turned toward all of creation all of the time and we get to walk and the freedom of that story. Amen. So I'm glad you're here because you, you serve as a living reminder to everybody else who is here. And I know for some of you, it's not easy to get here. Some of you have driven far. I know where some of you live. And I bless you. I bless you in this space that everything that you have, have had to give up in order to be here, that your spirit would be so blessed and so encouraged with abundant love and abundant mercy of God, that, that it, would all be, it would all be worth it for you. So if I haven't met you before, I'm Abigail, I'm the lead pastor, and, and uh, I just wanna take some time to welcome you this morning. Your presence is a gift, and I'm so glad you're here, and I wanna share a few things that are happening in our church community. Uh, can you believe that Easter is two Sundays away? One and then Easter. I can't even believe it came so quick. But this is one of our favorite Sundays in our church calendar because it's our time where we get to celebrate together the resurrected Lord and all of that of what that means for us. And we have a wonderful service that's already in the works, already being planned. It's going to be a great time for you to invite your friends, invite your family. We're going to have a wonderful children's program, and they're going to get to know Jesus better, and we're going to help encourage them toward Jesus in that space. And so even if you have nieces or nephews or neighbors in your life that you want to invite that's going to be a great time for them to get to know jesus um and something that we're going to do just to help lift maybe the burden or the chaos of the morning for you is we're going to have breakfast here starting at 9 a.m so we're going to have an oatmeal bar i know everybody's like Woo! i say breakfast burritos and everybody's like yeah and i say oatmeal bar it's like meh, meh. um there's so many dietary restrictions these days. But uh, th thanks to uh, Jacob here, because Jacob's the oatmeal bar king. And, and uh, <laughs> blame him. Everything that's not curable, we blame Jacob. Um, so we're going to have oatmeal bar, but we'll have some other things too. We'll have some baked goods and pastries and other yummy things. But we're going to have breakfast for you starting at 9. That'll be open from 9 to 9.45. Service will start promptly at 10 o'clock. So hopefully that just is a blessing to you, a blessing to those who you bring with you, children or whomever else, that you don't have to worry about getting breakfast going on Easter morning. You can get here, eat, relax, and prepare for our worship service. So again, that's just two Sundays away, April 9th. I am Quaker Jake, and... The one who, I guess, came up with the oatmeal bar idea. I don't know. Uh, Quaker, Quaker, love it. You guys are going to have such good digestion on Easter. Um, an oatmeal bar. It's like oatmeal with, like, endless toppings that you can put on it. Every, I think this happened because every Tuesday, our pastoral team meets at our house, and I'm always eating oatmeal, and I'm always putting all kinds of stuff in it. And so um, I, I guess they took that when we were like, well, what do we do for Easter? They're like, well, you like oatmeal, and you seem to like, be super happy every Tuesday when we're having our meeting. And uh, so I guess we went with that. So there'll be other things, too, I'm sure, right? Um, but anyhow, you, yeah, you can blame me, but you will have great digestion all day after the oatmeal part. <laughs> well, welcome. It's good to see you, and it's good to be together. And thank you, worship team, as always, for leading us. Um, before we jump in, we've been having so much fun with our youth in this room on Wednesday nights. You know, we meet here on Wednesdays and then do other things throughout 
uh, this spring, or I guess winter, now it's spring, but we just had so much fun. And so I'm just going to roll real quick, just to, you know, for the rest of you, to see what you're missing and see how you can come and, and get involved with us. This is kind of some of what's been going on for the last two months. So, hey, if you couldn't tell what all was going on there, um, that was Irish folk dancing that we did in this room on St. Patrick, that whole St. Patrick's uh, week. So you saw some Irish folk dance, and, and I thought nobody would do it. I had this idea on St. Pat to do Irish folk dancing in here with that TV back there, and, and oh my gosh, everyone was up and dancing and doing this thing fully choreographed, so much so that last week, the week after St. Pat, they wanted to do it again, and so... It has now become kind of tradition. There's Irish folk dancing every Wednesday in this room. That was Lucky Charm. What were we doing? Lucky Charms eating contest where they had to try to get the charms and not the cereal part, but the marshmallows only and spit them in a cup. And that was just wonderful and glorious. So um, all things that I'm certain St. Patrick ne never did. Um, ne ne neither danced an Irish jig or uh, ate Lucky Charms. But we were doing it in this room. You saw some footage from Joshua Tree just two weeks ago. We were out there in Joshua Tree had a blast with our youth. So if you have the desire to disciple the next generation, that's what we're doing. And so join us. Uh, we're here Wednesdays and weekends. We, we got events coming up, uh, so much stuff. We got a, a summer conference in June up in the mountains that we'll be heading to with all other vineyard churches and just the youth, junior high and high school. I hope to be down in Mexico again, goodness, in like next month or beginning of May. I'd uh, love to take some of you down there to see what's going on in Mexico. So, so many things happening with the youth and just wanted to kind of keep you in the loop and highlight some of them. We love them dearly. Well, spring, yes, is officially here, is it not? The winter rains are gone, are they? No. Um, I read this week we've had twice as much rain as Seattle. So, um, Seattle had 7.43 inches as of last week at Seattle Tacoma International Airport and at LAX we've had 15.65. So, we have doubled Seattle. Get that Subaru and uh, that parka because we have doubled Seattle in rain and I hear more is coming again another one this week so there you go but spring is here it will be august soon right and we will long for these days and we will remember fondly the winter of 2023 in the spring but august will be here and the clouds will disappear but anyhow it's good to be here new season together this morning i will be taking us through our sixth and uh some would say final sign in the book of John. And when I say sign, I'm simply talking about the miracles that we find in the Gospel of John. Uh, some would argue it's the sixth and final. I believe there's two more, which is why we'll do this for two more weeks next week. And then I, I think resurrection is a sign as well. So I think we'll go there and we'll end with resurrection as maybe the greatest sign the world has ever seen of the power and the life-giving uh, power of God unleashed in the world. But today, uh, number six is where we're going to be. We're in this series called Signs of life. Like Abigail said, yeah, two more weeks till Easter, and we're planning that with oatmeal, and we will be sitting down again this week with oatmeal at my table to plan that, and we've got some different kinds of, of course, some kind of different ways that we're going to approach things this year, and some twists and turns that we're excited about. So invite friends and family and neighbors. This is one of those Sundays people will come even who have nothing to do usually with the church and whatever. Uh, but it seems like, you know, Christmas Eve and, and Easter Sunday, my goodness, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. So if you have that person on your heart, go ahead and invite them. Why not? And, and we'll do that, so don't miss out on that. Well, today I want to invite you to find, if you have a Bible or a device with a biblical application on it, we're going to be in John chapter 11. 
Juan Once, se habla español. Um, so we're going to launch there from John 11, which is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. I, I remember we had at our coffee table or in our home growing up this Bible story book, and I remember this particular story from John 11 was like my absolute favorite. It had these really cool illustrations, and so when we'd read together as a family, and I remember opening and reading through this story in that Bible picture book, and so John 11 is where we're going to take it from today. This story, I'll be honest, we could go 14 different directions with this. There are so many different ways we could go, and we could be here easily till 6 or 7 p.m., kind of exploring those 14 different directions. I promise only to take it one or two, and that's all we're going to do today. I, I, I had about 14 sermons in mind when I read this, and I'm sticking to one or two of those directions that we're going to go. Um, it's the longest narrative in the Gospel of John. It's well over 40 verses to tell this story. And so it's the longest narrative. And so what I thought it would be, instead of me just reading it to you today over 40 verses, and I'd lose some of you at like verse 4 or 5, I, I thought we'd do it in a bit of a more creative way today, a unique way that I certain will keep you engaged. And so I had this thought Friday. I was in the APU Theology Library it was so quiet, I was falling asleep studying for this sermon because it was, I was the only one there. It was because like, who goes, what APU students on a Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. are going to the theology library? This guy. Um, and so I'm sitting there falling asleep studying for this particular sermon, and then this idea came. And so I thought, what if we had some of those same youth who were just in that video? What if there was like a, like a, you know those Hollywood table reads? Like a dramatic table reading of the story where they were like the characters in the story? And, and so they said they would. And so I'm going to invite, give a round of applause for five, I think, in the room. Come on up. Jack and Daniel and Adia, Julia and Grace. They're going to uh, and, and, and myself, together, the six of us, we have scripts in hand, and so uh, line up here, along here, along the front, so this camera, hopefully we'll see you here. Um, I'm going to back this up and get rid of this. Uh, so what we're going to do here is, if you're in John chapter 11, we are going to read. Now, mind you, what you are seeing here on stage is the first time this has ever been done, practiced, rehearsed. There is no rehearsal. That it whatsoever that has gone into this. And so what you're seeing live for the first time, these are five actors that have come into a Hollywood studio and they've been given a script. And we're gonna do a table reading of John 11. Each of them are a different character in the narrative. And the words will be up there, I believe, um, as we go through. I will narrate it, but they're gonna play the parts of all the characters. Does this make sense? All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna, and then we're just gonna have rapturous applause when it's over at the amazing job. They're not mic'd, so I've told them to project their voices so that Miss Sonia in the back can hear you. And uh, we'll just kind of see how this goes. All right, John, you guys ready? Everyone's got their script and they're ready. All right, they're very serious. They're like, all right. John 11, starting in verse one. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the, set, the sisters sent word to Jesus. When he heard this, Jesus said, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when they heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, they said, Jesus answered, After he had said this, he went on to tell them. His disciples replied. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought they meant natural sleep. So, he this, so then he told them plainly. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of his disciples, Let us 
On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, Martha answered, I know you will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. When you believe in me, you will not be willing, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord. She replied, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is the Son of the Lord. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not, yet ar- had, had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. He asked. Come and see, Lord. They replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he open the eyes of the blind man after this man's dying? Jesus once more, deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. He said, Oh, sorry. My fault. <laughs> Said Martha, the sister of the dead man. By this time, there is a bad odor. He has been there four days. Then Jesus said, So they took away the stone. And then Jesus looked up and said, When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, The end. Give it up for our teenage dramatic readers. So well, we are taking that on the road uh, for sure. That was not, not bad for our first time through. I only made one mistake with my highlighting. Sorry, Martha. Um, otherwise, spot on, spot on. Well, like I said before, there are so many different ways that we could take this extraordinary story. My favorite probably is a child that involves nothing short, no, no, nothing like Jesus taking on death and conquering, right? Um, and so... Uh, you know, as, as we read that, and if you're already thinking, wait, Jesus taking on death and conquering, is this not a bit of foreshadowing for what's coming up in a couple of weeks? Is this, is this John's kind of foreshadowing where the story is ultimately going? You would be right. But it is a bit of a roller coaster, is it not? It's a bit of an emotional roller coaster. It's a story with like twists and turns, ebbs and flows. It's like expect the unexpected because you expect it to go a certain way and it doesn't go that way. It starts with these two desperate sisters, are they not? These two desperate sisters and they're asking Jesus to come with them. They come and they seek Jesus because their, their brother Lazarus is at, is at home and he's sick and yet it's, uh, it, it's interesting that Jesus does not immediately go, does he? Uh, it's, it's, it's like the first unexpected twist. Throughout the book of John, Jesus has always responded to human need. But here, Jesus does not respond. Uh, he doesn't respond immediately. Instead, it says he, he stays a couple more days. And then you see behind me, it says you have another unexpected twist because you have Jesus saying to everybody gathered there, this sickness will not end in death. And then a few verses later, it appears that the sickness has ended in death, does it not? Because you have Jesus then saying, just a few verses later, uh, Lazarus, in fact, has died. 
he's dead, which is not super consistent with the first thing he said. That is, like, this sickness is not going to end in death. A few verses later, in fact, it has. And then when finally Jesus does go, you have one of his disciples, ever the optimist Thomas, who basically says, let's just all go and die with him. And, and you're like, oh my goodness. And this is just in the first part of the story alone. And so I just want to connect one or two things, like I said, take this one or two directions this morning that, that I think are important for, for us as, as we look here at how this incredible miracle, this incredible sign, in fact, as it has with every other sign that Jesus has performed, it points us to something more. It's the thing behind the thing. It's what's Jesus really doing here. And suffice it to say, Whatever that something more is, and there's always something more going on, isn't there? Whatever that something more is, I would argue that it's still going on today. That what Jesus does here in John 11, the something more that he's pushing us to, is exactly what Jesus wants to do in your life, in my life, in our life. And some of you would say it already has and it continues to over and over and over again. Well, back in John chapter 2. I want to take us back to the very first sign, which is interesting that the very first sign that Jesus performs is at a wedding, and now we, here we are at a funeral. Interesting. We got this, kind of these two major life events, a wedding where it all starts, and now we're kind of ending this section of the signs at a funeral. Uh, but back in John 2, you might remember, Jesus is a, he, he's at a wedding and he turns water into wine. He's in a place in, the, in, in a region known as the Galilee called Cana, and it's there that he performs this first miraculous sign. And John ends the narrative, as you see behind me. He ends the narrative in John chapter 2, in verse 11, with like this summary statement. It's the first of the signs, and John gives us like this summary statement as to why. The purpose of Jesus' miracles, the purpose of these signs. I'll read it here. It says, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs, and here's why, through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. And so from the beginning, we've been saying that there's this like twofold purpose going on with, through, through Jesus' signs in the miracle. Have you ever wonder why? Why does Jesus do miracles? Why does he do the miraculous? Why does he do these, uh, some of them are these exceptional provisional stories like uh, feeding of the 5,000 or the healing of a paralytic. Why does Jesus do these things? John tells us from the very beginning why. He says there's like a twofold purpose. I'll put them here. Number one, he says, to reveal the glory of Jesus. More on that in a second. So the first purpose John says is something about these reveals the glory, whatever that is, let's just hold that, the glory of Jesus. And if Jesus is the Son of God, the Word of God in human flesh, then we could say by virtue they're also revealing the glory of God, right? So there's, there's something about these signs that are revealing the glory of God or the glory of Jesus. And the second thing he says is that to elicit faith, that these signs seem to be a way of building faith, eliciting faith or belief, and his disciples believed in him, right? There's this element of faith, there's this element of belief, there's this element of trust, that his followers would, in fact, put their trust in him, in what he was doing, they, that they would trust that what Jesus was doing, the, this, this idea that Jesus, uh, it was all part of the redemption that God was bringing to the entire world, that they would put their trust and their faith in that. And so remember that every time Jesus heals someone, whether it's a paralytic or the royal official's son, um, what a, the, the blind man that he healed uh, in the pool of Siloam last week that we looked at, every time Jesus provides in some miraculous way, whether it's water, wh whether it's providing the choicest of wine, right, at this wedding in Cana, or whether it's feeding tens of thousands of people fish and bread uh, by the Sea of Galilee, whatever these things happen, these are moments, and this is very key, these are moments in the flesh, we'll keep coming back to this, in, in place and time, in history, in a particular place, these are moments when, and I'll put this up here, it's kind of a graphic, like a Venn diagram, heaven and earth intersect. Does this make sense? What we are seeing here, in a moment in time, in the flesh, is, is, is the intersection of heaven and earth, the overlap of heaven and earth. That is what's going on here. And, and, and when we see this overlap or this intersection through the sign or the miracle, what Jesus says we're seeing is what? The glory of God on display. 
God's glory literally is, is being revealed. And so the sign, the healing, the provision, the miracle, whatever it might be, is the means by which we see visibly in the flesh what God is doing here and now. In the book, in his book uh, entitled Gospel of Glory, which I was trying to stay awake reading at 2 p.m. on a Friday afternoon in the APU library by myself, um, didn't, didn't succeed. Took, I told Abigail when I came home, I think I was out for like 20 minutes at a table. You ever done that in a library where you're out for at least, I was like about 20 minutes. And then I woke up and read the rest of the book, but in his book, Gospel of Glory, which is theological reflections on the Gospel of John, a scholar by the name of Richard Bauckham, who I believe teaches at St. Andrews in Scotland, uh, he, he defi- I love the way he defines glory, and I think I said this in week one. He says, glory is the way in which the love of God is being shown to the world that God loves. I like that. The glory of God, at least in the book of John, is the way that God is revealing God's love through Jesus. That these signs, these miracles, these overlaps are really what? It's the love of God on display. It's the glory of God being revealed. This will really come into focus next week because next week we're going to look at another sign that happens on a cross where, boy, do we see the lengths at which God will go to reveal God's love to the world, the glory of God being revealed through a cross I mean, that's what we're going to talk about that uh, next week. Uh, I, I think of, when I think of glory, though, I immediately think of uh, Exodus. And, and I think of this conversation that God has with Moses back in, I, I believe it's Exodus 33. Remember this story where Moses is unsure about leading the people? He's been given this task of leading the Israelites after uh, the whole Exodus event earlier on in the story, and he's completely unsure, and he's basically in this kind of conversation with Yahweh, and with God, and, and, he, and he's saying, I'm not going to go unless you go. If your presence doesn't go, I'm not going, and how will I know, and how am I going to ever lead these people? And so there's all this uh, back and forth. It's, uh, there it is, Exodus 33 and 15 and 16. He's saying, if your presence doesn't go with us, don't send us here. Um, what's going to distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And then God basically responds, and, and he says to Moses, you know what, I'm going to do exactly what you've asked for. I'm going to be with you. My presence is going to go with you. And, and he says, and I'll be there for you. He says, because I'm pleased with you, and because I love you, and because I know you by name, he says to Moses. And then in verses 17 and 18, it's interesting. What does Moses say next? Now show me your what? Glory, and there's that word. Now show me, he says, your glory. And, and then God says, if you continue on in the narrative there in Exodus 33, that's not, a, not necessarily the best idea, Moses, and, uh, to show you all of my glory. But then it's interesting because God responds by talking about what, what's going to pass in front of Moses, his goodness. He says, I'll let my goodness pass in front of you. I'll let my mercy, my, he, he begins talking about God's mercy, God's compassion, God's goodness passing. You want to see my glory? I'll show you my, my goodness. I'll show you my mercy. I'll show you my compassion, which I don't know about you. When, you. when you start mixing all of those things together, the goodness of God and the mercy of God and the compassion of God, in my mind, what you begin seeing is what? The love of God on display for the world. I'm going to show you how much I love you. He can, he's saying to Moses, the glory of God, remember, is the way in which the love of God is being shown to the world that God loves. And, and I think we need to be clear, this is not love in some kind of esoteric, general, warm, fuzzy kind of feeling love, is it? And that's not what we're going to see next week at the cross. We're not going to see esoteric, general, warm feeling kind of love. This is love in action. This is love, again, this is why I keep coming back to this. This is love in flesh and bone and body and blood. This is incarnate, incarnated love. He's going to keep coming back with love made visible, love that can be seen and felt in the flesh. I was in a conversation on Friday evening with one of our five actors here at the table read and we were kind of talking about this idea of feeling the love of God and and in the conversation with one of them as we're talking about feeling the love of God this this person this young person was telling me about 
the love they had felt that particular night uh, from their friends, the way that their friends had just come around them in a moment of need, and they just felt the tremendous love from their friends. And, and I said to them, do you not think that that might have been how God was choosing to love you through your friends? And they were like, I think it could be. We were able to make this because you see it's always incarnated. It's not an esoteric, general, warm feeling kind of love. It's love that we feel in, within the flesh. And so we keep coming back to that over and over again. It's presence going with you and giving you rest, bringing you peace and wholeness maybe where there's chaos or brokenness. Now, hold that. Back to these signs then that Jesus performs. That they are visible, that they are in the flesh is absolutely essential. Because they point, remember that's what a sign does, it points to something beyond it. Here it is, they point again to the presence, or you could say the what? The glory of God. Or you could say what? The love of God being put on display, being revealed. And they invite us to put our faith and our trust in that love. Now with that in mind, I want to go back through what you heard here real quickly, and I want to pull out a few things, and I want to hopefully connect the glory of God being revealed, the love of God being put on display, all of that in a mixing bowl in this story, this beautiful story of Lazarus being called out of a tomb. Um, let's go back to the, uh, the two desperate sisters. The two desperate sisters that, that come to Jesus, imploring him on their behalf to heal their brother. Now, now what's interesting, if you go back and you kind of, uh, I, I know they gave a quick read, dramatic read, but if you kind of read it with a fine-tooth comb, what's interesting is, that, is the basis of their request. What do they root the request in? Go back, let's read it again. Lord, the one you what? The one you love is sick. They root their request in the what? The love that Jesus, in, in the relationship, in the love that Jesus has for their brother. And, and yet Jesus' response, and we said this at the beginning, this is one of those first twists, those first turns, this first unexpected thing, because they root the request in the love, but then it appears that Jesus does a rather unloving thing, doesn't it? He does what? Nothing. He, he simply does not answer the way that they were expecting him to answer. His response, rather, is to talk about, and here's where I said, here's where I started, Jesus' response is to talk about the something more that God is doing. Same thing last week with the blind man. Same exact thing. Who sinned? Here, his parents said he was born blind. Oh, neither. Let's talk about something more interesting. Let's talk about something far more fast. This is what's really going on here. Jesus does the same. He talks about something, that, something more that God is going to do through the sickness. Go back to verse 4. When Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness will not end in death. Okay? But then he says, no, it is for what? God's what? Glory. There's that word again. He says, this, this happened, your brother's sickness and impending death, it happened so that God's glory, he says, it is for God's glory, so that God's son, which is him obviously, may be what? Glorified through it, so that the love of God may be put on display in this Instance. Notice he immediately begins talking and, and, and how he immediately reframes the conversation of this one that he loves. That is very true. He says it's for the glory of God. It's the love of God. It's the mercy of God. It's the compassion of, of God, Jesus says. That's going to be revealed. Hang with the story. It's not over yet. He's basically saying this is going to be revealed. What's interesting as you read through the Bible, or at least the, I should say it this way, what's interesting as you read through the Gospels is how Jesus consistently reframes human brokenness. He's always doing this. He's consistently reframing human brokenness as an opportunity for seeing the work of God on display or the glory of God being revealed to humanity. It's exactly what he did in John 9. They're, they want to talk about who's at fault. What happened here that this guy, what is Jesus? Jesus reframes it as a what? 
Let's not, let's not ask why, let's ask what for. This is an opportunity, for, he says to his disciples, for the works of God to be made known, to be put on display, so, to point to something bigger that God is doing in the world. Or you could say it this way, for the glory of God to be revealed. So my question to us this morning would be, what would it look like for you and I to trust Jesus to do the same in our life? What would that look like? To reframe our brokenness to reframe whatever ails us, whatever worries us, to reframe it, to take that thing in us that is most broken, that is most lost, that is most sick, that is most hurting, that seems like most confusing, what would it look like to take that and to do as Jesus consistently does in the Gospels, which is to reframe it as an, os- as an opportunity for the glory of God to be put on display for all who we interact with to see. What might that look like? Because John then reiterates that the love that Jesus does love this family. If you go back to the next, he says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. He, he takes us right back to the love again. And, and yet, in a surprising kind of way then, Jesus does the opposite of what might feel loving. He chooses to seemingly do nothing when they want him to, doesn't he? He doesn't do the thing they want him to do when they want him to do the thing, right? He doesn't do it. They want him to do the thing. The thing is, they've seen him heal. They've seen him do things like this before, and they want him to do this for their brother when they want him to do it, right? Which is when? Now, before he dies. That's when. And maybe you've been there too, I don't know. Maybe you're there now. If I asked you, are you fairly certain that Jesus loves you? Many of you in the room would say, yes, Jesus loves me, this I do know. I've been told that the Bible there's something to say about that. Um, I know that Jesus loves me. I, I, at least conceptually, sure. God loves me. Jesus loves me. I'm convinced, yeah. And, and maybe, convinced of that, you have some things in your life right now that you're asking him to do. Some pain, some frustration, some confusion, some doubt, some disillusionment, some desperation, some whatever provision that you're needing. You're asking him to do something on behalf of the one that you're fairly convinced he loves. Or you're asking him to do something on behalf of the ones that you love, right? On their behalf. Would you please step into their life? Would you please change this about, would you please enter this situation and change this, whatever it be, whatever it, whatever it might be. And, and, and so what you're asking for, what you're needing, really, you're asking for a visible sign, right? Give me a sign of your what? Love, compassion, mercy. Show me, you're basically like Moses saying what? Show me your, show me your glory. Do something. Step in. Respond in some way. And yet it seems like the presence of God, because he says, my presence will go with you. And, and for some of you, perhaps you're like, but it seems like the presence is not going with, you, with me. It seems like Jesus' presence doesn't go with Mary and Martha, does it? Stays right where he is for two more days. And maybe you're in that season. You're in a season right now where you're asking, Jesus, please, show me your glory. Show me your love. I want a visible in the flesh. I'm not talking about some esoteric warm feeling. I want to know now that you're with me and with my children and with my, with my coworker, whatever it might be. I need you to respond now. And two days go by and he doesn't do anything. But remember, 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 this story is full of surprises and unexpected twists and turns. And, and, and you gotta kind of keep going. Because I seem, I, I don't know about you, but it seems to me that's generally the human experience, right? The unexpected, the twist, the turn. And this leads to a section of the story that, that, that I think is the, the lived, for many of us, it's our lived experience. And I love the fact that John draws this out in two of the characters that were here on stage, because I call this next section of the story the if you had been here part. Or you could frame it this way, if only, right? If only you had done what I wanted you to do when I wanted you to do it. If only then. 
Because when Jesus does eventually respond, if you follow the narrative through, when he does eventually respond, because he eventually does, but it's four days later, right? By the time he gets there, it's at least four days later when he eventually does respond. And it seems far too late. Lazarus, is, he, not only is Lazarus dead, he's been in the grave how many days? In four days. In, in, in typical, uh, within first century Judaism, the deceased were always buried on the day of their death. When someone in your family died, you buried them that day. They were buried the day of the de- that, that, that they died, and then for six additional days, they would go through a process called sitting shiva. Uh, sitting shiva was basically where you had six days after the day of death, where there would be six days of mourning, where you would stay at home, and relatives would come, and family and neighbors and the community would come, and they would bring you food, and they would offer their sympathies and their condolences for those seven days. And it appears that Jesus shows up over halfway through sitting shiva, right? Day four, this has been going on now for days. Food has been brought, condolences have been given, and Lazarus has been in the grave for days. And so Jesus shows up, and I don't know, but the assumption has to be, what did you bring? Did you bring a meal to give the family? Uh, Jesus showed up with a sympathy card, he and his disciples. We've come too to offer our condolences for your family. Sorry we're late, four days late. And that's when one of the sisters, Martha, comes in the first one, if you had been here, right? One of the sisters confronts him with an if only. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. The older, the other sister, Mary, she reacts the exact same way when she comes in. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, if only, right, my brother would not have died. It's interesting that at the beginning of the narrative, John tells us that's the same Mary who later in chapter 12, if you keep reading the story, will end up at Jesus' feet again, won't she? But this time anointing it for his burial. Why putting, uh, you know, the expensive perfume, wiping it with her hair, that's in chapter 12, that's coming, and John's like, it's the same Mary. She'll be at his feet again in a chapter, this time anoint, anointing him for burial before he is betrayed, yet here she is at his feet, and this time she's bringing, she's confronting him, right? She's bringing what? Disappointment and despair to his feet. She's not bringing the perfume to anoint them, she's bringing her anger, her consternation, her disappointment to his feet. If only he had come sooner, if only you had been here, she says. Where was his presence for those four days? Where was his love? Where was his compassion? Where was his mercy? This tells me a couple of things that will be helpful, I hope, to at least one person in the room. And I will land with these two things. Number one, it's okay to bring your if only to Jesus. You can handle it, go ahead and confront him and be mad. It's totally okay. Tells me it's okay. Jesus can handle your if only. Because I bet every one of us in the room has one. We had, a, we had an idea of how it was going to go, and it didn't go the way we thought it was going to go. We even prayed about it, asked it to go a certain way. It's not going that way. Or at least it hasn't yet, right? If only you would do this. If only you would step into their life. If only you would change them. If only, if only, if, if, if only my boss, if only my kids, if only my husband, if only my wife, if only my professor, if only this didn't hurt so much. If only, right? We all have one. It's okay. This tells me, Mary and Martha, do it. Go ahead. Confront. Confront him. Jesus can handle our human disappointment and despair. And, and, and here's an important follow-up to that, and you've got to hang with this. Ready? Because if you hang around long enough, and if you follow John's story to its completion, Jesus will enter human disappointment and despair very soon with you. Because the next time Mary comes to his feet, it's going to be on the eve of his own, what? Anger and disappointment and despair and pain, and suffering, and betrayal, and isolation. You've got to hang with the story. So go ahead and confront him. Do it. But stay with the story. Because next week we'll get to a garden where Jesus will stare his own impending brutal death 
in the face. And he will seem, read it carefully, he will, he will go to prayer with the Father and seem slightly disappointed in the answer he gets, right? If there's another way, right? Let's go a different way. Let's do it. If there's another way, slightly disappointed in the plan. There will be some despair to the point of shedding blood, of tears of blood, right? There will be blood. There will be tears. There will be darkness and disappointment and despair. So you got to stick with the story. There will be, in the Garden of Gethsemane next week, a very large if only. God, if only there were, Father, if only there were another way. Let's take that one. If only. And then on the cross, you'll hear Jesus asking the proverbial question, why, won't you? My God, my God, you finish it. Where have you gone? Where's the presence? Where's the compassion? Where's the love? Where's the mercy? You gotta stick with the story to the end. So yeah, first thing, it's okay to bring your if only to Jesus. He'll say what? I'm with you too in that. I've been there too. Our disappointment and our despair does not mean the love of God for you or for those that you love has changed in any way whatsoever. It means nothing about the love changing. And right after this exchange, this is beautiful, because right after this whole exchange with Mary and Martha, when Jesus gets confronted with their pain and their, their disillusionment with him, what do we find Jesus do? Entering into their sorrow and weeping with them, right? Is that not beautiful or what? He enters into the sorrow and he stands with them, sitting Shiva, and he weeps. Jesus wept. Which leads to two reactions in the room. Some look at him and go, what? Oh, see how he loved him. The love of God on display. There is that reaction, and some of us have that reaction when it comes to our own. And some have another reaction, and it's this one. Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? And so you have both reactions, and I'm fairly certain probably both reactions are in the room today. Uh, second thing, real quick, this tells me. Sometimes, this tells me that sometimes God's glory or God's love, compassion, and mercy is expressed in an unexpected kind of way that's going to require us to see the future with different eyes. It's going to require a new way of seeing what God might be doing, a, a new way of looking at the future. Because, because Jesus tells them, he goes to the tomb and he says, take away the what? Take the stone away. He sat in the despair, and now we're going to do something. He says, take away the stone, to which he gets a fair amount of pushback from the sister, right? Who knows when we take away the stone, what's going to be released? An awful odor. He's been decomposing for four days. So she knows. And again, it's unexpected. Go ahead and take away the stone. And, and here's what Jesus does, and I think this is important. Here's what Jesus does, and here's what Jesus doesn't do. Jesus does not take Mary and Martha back to the past four days and change things, does he? He doesn't try to rewrite history. He doesn't do that. It happened. Lazarus is dead. It happened. He doesn't try to rewrite the past. He doesn't go back as disappointed and confused as they might be. Jesus does not take them back and try to change that. Instead, what he does, and this is key, he meets them in the present with future hope. And that means everything for every human being who's ever lived. He meets them in the present with the future. He takes them into the future. I told you we're going here in two weeks, aren't we? He takes them into the future. He literally takes them to resurrection. And he, and he shows them that. He says, I am the resurrection, right? And the life. And then he shows them a glimpse of where the whole story is going. 
And then he brings that back into the present. And, and, and look at what he says. Did I not tell you that if you believe, there's that word, you will see what? The glory of God. The love of God on display. The compassion of God. The mercy of God. Did I not tell you if you hang with me in this story, it's not over? You will see the glory of God. You will see it revealed. Not because I, and this is key, not because I can resurrect the dead and as some kind of one-time isolated event, but because I am the resurrection. And I'm going to invite you into that, into who I am. I am the resurrection, he says to them. Ultimately, the resurrection is not something that happened. It is not an isolated that happened. Resurrection is a person. You are invited to follow. You are invited to orient your entire life around resurrection. It's where the whole story is going. It's a sign that points us to the future of where human history is ultimately going. It's a person that we can turn to and we can trust today and simply ask to bring whatever is in that heavenly future, Lord, bring it into the present. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Where? Here on earth as it is in heaven. He taught us to pray. Jesus brings the future into the present that day. He gives them a visible, tangible display of his love and his mercy and his compassion and his life-giving power when he utters those three famous words, Lazarus, come out. And all who were standing at the entrance of that grave on that day, what did they see? The glory of God revealed. They saw love on display. They saw a display. When Lazarus stumbled out with hands still wrapped in grave clothes, still on. Because in, in a couple of weeks, there'll be another who stumbles out of a grave, but he'll leave the clothes behind. He'll leave them in the tomb. This is all going towards resurrection. It's okay to bring our if-onlys to Jesus. Rainier, come on up. But when we do, when we bring our if-onlys to Jesus, we have to... <laughs> We, we got to leave room for the possibility that this may go some unexpected kind of way, a surprising kind of way, and that Jesus will respond in a way that will ultimately bring him glory, whatever that response might be. I promise you it will be loving. I promise you it will be full of mercy and compassion and goodness. If you're willing to follow it through with Jesus, I promise you it will lead to resurrection and life. Because he said, I am the resurrection and the life. That much I know to be true. So let's do this. Um, Rainier's going to play. We've got a few minutes. And let's go back to Moses on a mountain. And let's pray that. God, would you show us your glory? Would you put your glory on display in this room? Let's just begin to pray that together. Now show me your glory. Lord, show us your love. Show us your goodness. May it pass in front of us. Your goodness. Show us your compassion. Show us your mercy. Show us your favor. We ask that you would put it on display today. In the flesh in the midst of whatever brokenness we bring into the room today, in the midst of whatever disappointment that we carry, in the midst of our own, our own if-onlys, if only you had been here, if only you had gone, it had, this had happened, if only, we bring it all to you today. And we lay it like, like Mary, we, we lay it at your feet. Beautiful feet. Feet that will enter into that pain and that suffering very soon we lay it there today so we bring so just just do that whatever it is whatever the if only is that you're carrying today we all got one I want you to picture yourself right now approaching the feet of Jesus and and putting it there go ahead if you need to say it to him say if only Jesus if only you had been there if 
lonely. I know this is a vulnerable space to be in, especially when we're kind of coming to grips, coming to terms with some of our own pain and some of our own disappointment. I know these are not small things. And so let's do this. We'll, we'll begin to sing. Sue, you're going to be available to pray. We're, we have a, a prayer corner that we've set up over here. If you want to bring your if only, Sue's going to be in there. Maybe Abigail uh, will we'll hang here. And if you'd like to receive prayer for that today, you say, I'm having a hard time leaving this at the feet of Jesus and believing that there could be resurrection and life out of this having a hard time would you pray with me would you would you walk with me in this would you help me uh, they'll be there and uh would love to pray with you and we'll see whatever anything else the spirit of god wants to do in the room but i know this can be vulnerable space to kind of come to terms with today as it was i'm sure vulnerable for martha and mary to approach jesus and say those things to him let's stand together and let's sing We'll just begin to worship, Sue and others, if you want to go over there to our prayer area, if you need that today, let's just begin to sing, we'll see if the Lord wants to do anything else.
He said, I just got a, a sense I want to pray for sinus infections. And some people responded. I think Howie received some kind of instantaneous healing. Uh, an opening of sinuses just cleared immediately, which when, when something like that happens, we just say, what a visible, rep- a sign, visible representation of the love and the compassion and the mercy of God being displayed, right? That's all it is. So can we do this before we leave? I know there's pain in the room, physical pain today. There, some of us are in physical pain. Uh, last week it was sinuses. Could we, could we just pray over that today? Because and, and, here's the deal. You know, oftentimes when I'm praying physically for someone and you know, for physical pain, again, we're kind of asking, we know where the future is going. Like wholeness, right? Resurrection, resurrected body and the wholeness. That's the future. We're just asking for a little bit of that in the present. Like, can we pull some of that future me into the present? Because like present me is falling apart and present me is hurting and present me is in pain. And, and I get this, I, I, I get the complexity of it all. Because truth is, yeah, Jesus resurrects Lazarus uh, from his death, but Lazarus dies again, right? That's true. That's just, he falls apart again eventually and dies again. And so, yeah, okay. But could we just, could we ask for a visible display of God's love just over physical pain today? And, and so I want you to sing that chorus again. And. Those of you just, if, if you'd be willing to be honest, you're just right now in physical pain. Like something's just not working the way it was intended. I know Jan has been having some debilitating leg pain. We want to pray over that. Diane. And, and so see these hands. Can we come around some of these with Leonard, Howie, Diane? And, and can we just like sing over them, Lord, we need you? And let's just, even as we're singing, just if you don't know what to pray, Jesus, would you bring your kingdom? Bring a little bit of that future kingdom to the present now. And, and, and would you show them your love, show them your compassion, show them your mercy, and, and remove this pain, whatever it is. Can we pray towards that as we just close? I just feel like we'd be remiss. We can talk about this in theory, you know? Like, theoretically, we're like, yeah, show us your glory. No, let's see it now. And we saw that with Howie last week, and we don't know why. And sometimes God just breaks in in that moment, and the person is set free, and the person, the pain is gone. Or there's just a tremendous... Um, improvement in what's going on. So could we do that? And then uh, Sue is going to hang there and Abigail over here in our prayer corner if you just got to bring an if only and get some prayer for that. So where are my, I know Diane, let's gather around. Leonard, who else? Who else? Jan, Lana, thank you. Let's pray over them. So Rainy, you start singing, I'm just going to start praying. So King Jesus, we're asking right now, would you release your healing power, the healing power we read about, the signs that we read about in the book. Would you do it in our head? Some of our friends who are sitting in pain right now, would you release your power to heal? Would you bring some of your future, that future heaven to the presence? Lord, we're praying for pain to be alleviated. We're praying for sickness to go. We're asking, Lord, that you would fix what is wrong in some of us, where there is where there is inflammation, that it would be reduced, where there is swelling, that it would be reduced. We ask, Lord, we need you for your children. We just come to your feet as kids, and we simply ask you, like Mary and Martha, we need you. Would you step into our space and our time, and would you heal? Would you release your power? Bring your kingdom in this room. Pray for a visible display today of your love to be released in people today. Would you release your love? Would you show us your glory? Put it on display in this room. Jan's life. Would you release the pain? Would you, would you take the pain away? Would you give her comfort? Pain of the inflammation he's feeling in his hips. Lord, we pray that you would take that pain away.
We believe you are the truth. You are the life. So we trust you, Jesus. We're going to walk with you. We walk with our friends. Whatever it is, we trust you. We give you their pain. Thank you that you go with us into it, into the pain. We ask you release resurrection. I believe he paid for his own. 